Results from the lunar orbiter probes had revealed that lunar gravity varies slightly due to the presence of mass concentrations, or mascons. Data from the missions, and from the lunar subsatellites left by Apollo 15 and 16, were used to map such variations in lunar gravity. Originally planned to launch on December 6, 1972, at 9.53 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Apollo 17 was the final crewed Saturn V launch, and the only one to occur at night. The launch was delayed by 2 hours and 40 minutes due to an automatic cutoff in the launch sequencer at the T-32 mark in the countdown. The cause of the problem was quickly determined to be the launch sequencer's failure to automatically pressurize the liquid oxygen tank in the third stage of the rocket. Although launch control noticed this and manually caused the tank to pressurize, the sequencer did not recognize the fix and therefore paused the countdown. The clock was reset and held at the T-22 minute mark while technicians worked around the malfunction in order to continue with the launch. This pause was the only launch delay in the Apollo program caused by a hardware problem. The launch window, which had begun at the originally planned launch time of 9.53 p.m. on December 6, remained open until 1.31 a.m., the latest time at which a launch could have occurred during the December 6-7 window. Approximately 500,000 people observed the launch in the immediate vicinity of Kennedy Space Center, despite the early morning hour. The launch was visible as far away as 800 kilometers, and observers in Miami, Florida, reported a red streak crossing the northern sky. Among those in attendance at the program's final launch were astronauts Neil Armstrong and Dick Gordon, as well as centenarian Charlie Smith, who alleged he was 130 years old at the time of Apollo 17. In the hours following the launch, Apollo 17 orbited the Earth while the crew spent time monitoring and checking the spacecraft to ensure its readiness to depart Earth orbit. Ground controllers chose a faster trajectory for Apollo 17 than originally planned to allow the vehicle to reach lunar orbit at the planned time, despite the launch delay. The command and service module separated from the SIVB approximately half an hour following the SIVB trans-lunar injection burn, after which Evans turned the spacecraft to face the LM, still attached to the SIVB. The CSM then docked with the LM and extracted it from the SIVB. Following the LM extraction, Mission Control programmed the SIVB, no longer needed to propel the spacecraft, to impact the moon and trip the seismometers left by prior Apollo crews. Approximately nine hours after launch, the crew concluded the mission's first day with a sleep period, until waking up to begin the second day. Mission Control and the crew decided to shorten the mission's second day, the first full day in space, in order to adjust the crew's wake-up times for the subsequent days in preparation for an early morning wake-up time on the day of the lunar landing, then scheduled for early afternoon. This was done since the first day of the mission had been extended because of the launch delay. Following the second rest period, and on the third day of the mission, the crew executed the first mid-course correction, a two-second burn of the CSM service propulsion engine to adjust the spacecraft's moon-bound trajectory. Following the burn, the crew opened the hatch separating the CSM and LM in order to check the LM systems and concluded that they were nominal. So that events would take place at the time indicated in the flight plan, the mission clocks were moved ahead by 2 hours and 40 minutes, the amount of the launch delay, with 1 hour of it at 45 hours 0 minutes and 0 seconds into the mission and the remainder at 65 hours 0 minutes and 0 seconds. The crew found that one of the latches holding the CSM and LM together was unlatched. While Schmidt and Cernan were engaged in a second period of LM housekeeping beginning just before 60 hours into the mission, Evans worked on the Baki lash. A few hours before entry into lunar orbit, the SIM door on the SM was jettisoned. Following orbit insertion and orbital stabilization, the crew began preparations for the landing at Taurus Littro. Lunar landing the day of the landing began with a checkout of the lunar module systems, which revealed no problems preventing continuation of the mission. Cernan, Evans, and Schmidt each donned their spacesuits, and Cernan and Schmidt entered the LM in preparation for separating from the CSM and landing. The LM undocked from the CSM, and the two spacecraft orbited close together for about an hour and a half while the astronauts made visual inspections and conducted their final pre-landing checks. After finally separating from the CSM, the LM Challenger and its crew of two adjusted their orbit, such that its lowest point would pass about 10.5 miles above the landing site, and began preparations for the descent to Taurus Littro. While Cernan and Schmidt prepared for landing, Evans remained in orbit to take observations, perform experiments and await the return of his crewmates a few days later. Soon after completing their preparations for landing and just over two hours following the LM's undocking from the CSM, Cernan and Schmidt began their descent to the Taurus Littrow Valley on the lunar surface with the ignition of the lunar module's descent propulsion system engine. 
Approximately 10 minutes later, as planned, the LM pitched over, giving Cernan and Schmidt their first look at the landing site during the descent phase and allowing Cernan to guide the spacecraft to a desirable landing target while Schmidt provided data from the flight computer essential for landing. Challenger landed about 656 feet east of the planned landing point. During their approximately 75-hour stay on the lunar surface, Cernan and Schmidt performed three moonwalks. During lunar surface operations, Commander Cernan always drove the rover, while Lunar Module Pilot Schmidt was a passenger who assisted with navigation. The first lunar excursion began four hours after landing, at 6.54 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on December 11. After exiting through the hatch of the LM and descending the ladder to the footpad, Cernan took the first step on the lunar surface of the mission. Just before doing so, Cernan remarked, I'm on the footpad. And, Houston, as I step off at the surface at Taurus Litro, we'd like to dedicate the first step of Apollo 17 to all those who made it possible. After Cernan surveyed the exterior of the LM and commented on the immediate landing site, Schmidt joined Cernan on the surface. The first task was to offload the rover and other equipment from the LM. While working near the rover, Cernan caught his hammer under the right rear fender extension, accidentally breaking it off. The crew made a short-lived fix using duct tape at the beginning of the second EVA, attaching a paper map to the damaged fender. Following deployment and testing the maneuverability of the rover, the crew deployed the ALSEP just west of the landing site. Instead, following the deployment of the ALSEP, Cernan and Schmidt drove to Steno Crater, to the south of the landing site. The first EVA ended after 7 hours and 12 minutes. On December 12, awakened by a recording of, Ride of the Valkyries, played from Mission Control, Cernan and Schmidt began their second lunar excursion. Cernan and Schmidt then departed for Station 2 Nansen Crater, at the foot of the South Massif. At Station 3, Schmidt fell to the ground while working, looking so awkward that Parker jokingly told him that NASA's switchboard had lit up seeking Schmidt services for Houston's ballet group, and the site of Station 3 was in 2019 renamed Ballet Crater. Cernan took a sample at Station 3 that was to be maintained in vacuum until better analytical techniques became available, joking with the Capcom, Parker, about placing a note inside. Stopping at Station 4 Shorty Crater the astronauts discovered orange soil, which proved to be very small beads of volcanic glass formed over 3.5 billion years ago. Post-mission sample analysis revealed that Shorty is not a volcanic vent, but rather an impact crater. This fire fountain sprayed molten lava high into the lunar sky in the moon's early days, some 3.5 billion years ago and long before Shorty's creation. The final stop before returning to the LM was Camelot Crater. Throughout the sojourn, the astronauts collected 34 kilograms of samples, took another 7 gravimeter measurements, and deployed three more explosive packages. Concluding the EVA at 7 hours and 37 minutes, Cernan and Schmidt had completed the longest duration EVA in history to date, traveling further away from a spacecraft and covering more ground on a planetary body during a single EVA than any other spacefarers. Cernan and Schmidt rode the rover northeast of the landing site, exploring the base of the North Massif in the sculptured hills.